thing to do. We got more coming around. I think we shouldn't cut the mask. You know, we we'll save those for later. No, those faces are nice. Just leave them like that. Cut them next time. A long time ago, somewhere in October of 1980, my dad and my brother and I went to see a strange double feature at the Woodfield Theaters in Schaumburg, Illinois. Stardust Memories, the new Woody Allen film, and Somewhere in Time, a romantic drama starring Superman. We were there at the behest of my younger brother, who despite being nine years old, really wanted to see the Woody Allen movie for some reason. I'm sure my dad appreciated the fact that we were getting two movies for the price of one, the average movie ticket costing a whopping $3 back in 1980. I remember enjoying Stardust Memories, despite not comprehending most of it. As for Somewhere in Time, I liked it, although not nearly as much as the other movies I saw that same year. But Somewhere in Time stuck in the back of my easily distracted 13-year-old mind, and after revisiting it a few more times over the past 10 years, it's become a favorite of mine. It's a metaphysical time travel story set in a large hotel, kind of like another movie released that same year. Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour are great in it. They reportedly fell in love during the production, which only adds to the film's aura. The fairly conventional direction by Jeno Swark keeps the film firmly grounded in the aesthetics of 1980, giving it a strong hauntological effect when watching it today. And the beloved score by John Barry has an unusually powerful emotional impact, so much so that the film's theme became a hit song in Hong Kong, the only market where the film was a bona fide hit. But although Somewhere in Time flopped just about everywhere else upon its initial release, the movie's reputation and audience has grown substantially over the past 40 years. Part of what makes the film so compelling is its elegant depiction of time travel. Most time travel stories involve high-powered technology. Somewhere in time has none of that. Many time travel stories make an effort to explain how time travel might work, often referencing ideas from theoretical physics. I have a question for you, sir. Shoot. Is time travel possible? That is a question. And the answer is clearly yes, according to Richard's college professor. He just doesn't really explain how it's possible. In order to get some answers, we need to turn to the Richard Matheson novel that the film was based on, originally titled Bid Time Return. Matheson may have felt that these concepts wouldn't bear explanation in the movie and thus didn't include them in his screenplay. But after reading the novel and revisiting the film, I've identified several philosophical ideas that drive the story. And I should point out that there's really no way to show how the movie demonstrates these concepts without spoilers. The story begins in 1972, when aspiring playwright Richard Collier is approached by a mysterious old woman who gives him a pocket watch. Eight years later, Richard decides to take a trip to an old hotel where he discovers a 1912 portrait of Elise McKenna, grand dame of the American theater. He grows inexplicably obsessed with the photograph, reads up everything he can about Elise and her time period, and travels back to 1912 to meet her. She's been somehow expecting him, and they fall in love. Soon thereafter, he's tragically sent back to 1980. All that Elise has left of him is the pocket watch. Richard soon dies after his return, but is then reunited with Elise somewhere beyond the physical plane. Okay. Before we embark on a trip through time, we should try to understand what time is. In the novel, Richard Collier reads a book by British playwright J.B. Priestley. Man and Time surveys a broad range of ideas from ancient traditions, philosophy, and physics. One idea presented comes from the astronomer Gustav Stromberg, who claims the existence of a five-dimensional space-time world of physics. He calls it the Eternity Domain, it lies beyond both space and time in their physical sense. In this domain, present, past, and future are without meaning. This is a variation on an idea known as eternalism. The entirety of space-time, all events past, present, and future, coexist in a four-dimensional block universe. I can see it all at once. 
So the past, the present, and the future... No, the future's already there. It's irrevocable and cannot be changed. You are here, you have always been here, and you will always be here. A good analogy for the block universe is the audiovisual material on a reel of film or encoded on the surface of a DVD. All the events that we experience in time, from beginning to end, are all present in one place. Another book that's mentioned in the novel is in Elise's collection, An Experiment with Time by J.W. Dunn, published in 1927. Although Dunn's theory of time isn't actually discussed, a different movie does provide a brief summary. 1971's Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Now here's a painting of a landscape. Now the artist who painted that picture says something is missing. What is it? It is I myself who was part of the landscape I painted. So he mentally takes a step backward or regresses and paints a picture of the artist painting a picture of the landscape. But still something is missing. And that something is still his real self painting the second picture. So he regresses further and paints a third. But because something is still missing, he paints a fourth and a fifth. So infinite regression then is... It is the moment when our artist has regressed to the point of infinity and himself becomes part of the landscape he painted and is both the observer and the observed. Here's J.B. Priestley demonstrating infinite regress on TV in 1955. Well, I don't like the look of the back of that man's head. Dunn called his theory serialism and it proposes that our everyday experience of one-dimensional time might be observed from higher dimensions of time by higher levels of consciousness. These multiple dimensions extend out infinitely, beyond the physical and finite, beyond death. If we look at timelines representing the lives of Richard and Elise from birth to death, we can see the one-way trajectory of their finite experience of time. In physics, these are called world lines, and they show the path of any object through space-time. That line in between represents the one hiccup in this whole thing, which is Richard's brief vacation in 1912. That doesn't alter the fact that their world lines have a beginning and an end. But there's one object in the story that does not. Elise gives Richard a pocket watch in 1972. Richard travels back to 1912 and leaves behind the watch and Elise suffers 60 years of heartache before giving the watch back to Richard, and the cycle repeats. Everything that exists in the material world has a beginning and an end, but not the pocket watch. It has no origin. No artisan made it, no factory produced it, and it's never broken or destroyed. The pocket watch is a good illustration of a concept from mathematical physics called a closed time-like curve or CTC. It's a world line that returns to its starting point. CTCs not only suggest the possibility of time travel, but also call into question our everyday understanding of cause and effect. Like the pocket watch, a closed time-like curve circles back on itself and doesn't have an actual starting point. All events are simultaneous, and linear causality ceases to mean anything. There is no cause and effect as we experience it. This is analogous to Buddhist concepts like dependent origination and Indra's net. Joseph Campbell explains. It's a net of gems where every gem reflects all the other ones. And they also have the idea of uh, simultaneous arising. Everything arises in relation to everything else. And so you can't blame anybody for anything. And so everything links to everything else and although the pocket watch symbolizes the infinite, the fact that it's a clock also represents our imprisonment in time. Its cyclical interaction with Richard and Elise's world lines symbolize the mysterious connection between our finite universe and the infinite. But enough speculation about how time works. How did he do it? Richard's college professor can finally be of some help. If I attempt to hypnotize my mind suggests to it that it isn't 1971, it's August 1571. And I spelled out the details for myself and did it over and over and again and again and again. 
In the novel, Richard recalls seeing an old movie called Barclay Square, which was based on an unfinished Henry James novel from 1917 called The Sense of the Past. It's the story of a 20th century man who explores his ancestor's 18th century home so obsessively that he actually finds himself 100 years in the past. Richard also uses the principles of Psycho-Cybernetics, a self-help book from 1960. In order to reprogram his subconscious into believing that the year is 1912, he submits himself to rigorous self-hypnosis. This process is similar to something called past life regression therapy. So Dr. Oz and I are standing backstage in the control room. It's about 10 minutes before the show. Right now in the studio, Dr. Brian Weiss, who is a world-renowned psychiatrist in the field of past life regression, is hypnotizing or trying to hypnotize our entire audience. I think he has hypnotized. He's very good at it. <laughs> Dr. Weiss believes that we've all been here before, and by recalling our past lives, he says, we can better understand who we are now. Skeptics roll their eyes at regression therapy. My wife actually submitted to a session once, and she insists that she had an out-of-body experience. Psychic phenomena like astral projection and remote viewing have been studied by the likes of the CIA. It is June 27, 1912. Richard Collier's approach actually has its roots in an earlier Richard Matheson story. In the 1960 Twilight Zone episode, A World of His Own, another playwright records his desired outcome on tape. She is dressed in a soft pink blouse, old-fashioned brooch, flowing skirt. Her hair is attractively arranged. She is in her husband's study, preparing him a drink. This is an example of what is currently called manifesting. The practice of focusing the power of the mind to affect changes in material reality. Elise McKenna is very familiar with these ideas. In the novel, she tells Richard about the time she met Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, and an influential figure in the New Thought Movement. By 1912, alternative spirituality was taking root in the United States in many different forms, including Theosophy, Vedanta, Spiritualism, and the 1908 publication of the Kabbalion, which declared that the universe is mental. When Richard approaches Elise for the first time, she's already been expecting him. This is partially because of her manager, who's had precognitive dreams about a man who would come into Elise's life and disrupt everything. But there's another reason why she anticipated Richard's arrival. During Elise's performance of a play, she suddenly goes off script and improvises a monologue about how she manifested Richard. The man of my dreams has almost faded now. And what man is that, miss? The one I have created in my mind. Elise's career as an actress and Richard's as a playwright are keys to the metaphysical position that informs the story. Creativity, the human imagination, is the microcosmic equivalent of the consciousness that creates the universe. The same way a writer invents a character or an actor embodies a role is the same process through which the physical world comes into being. This view is central to philosophical idealism and certain forms of panpsychism, theories proposing observer-dependent reality where consciousness is fundamental. The whole of reality could be a mental projection, or a simulation, or a hologram, or a dream. During the film's production, Christopher Reeve was not on set during the shooting of Elise's monologue directed toward Richard. In order for Jane Seymour to be actually looking at someone as she performed the scene, Richard Matheson sat in the seat and she performed to him. She is speaking to the author, which is pretty meta. The character comes to life and addresses her creator, while rhapsodizing about the man she created in her mind. There's so much to say. I cannot find the words, except for these. I love you. Love doesn't usually feature so prominently in science fiction. 
Is it possible that love is the essential component that enables us to move freely through four-dimensional space-time? But maybe we've spent too long trying to figure all this out with theory. You're a scientist, Bran. So listen to me when I say that love isn't something we invented. It's observable, powerful. Love has meaning, yes. Social utility, social bonding, child rearing. We love people who have died. Where's the social utility in that? Maybe it's some evidence, some artifact of a higher dimension that we can't consciously perceive. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. In the 1962 film, La Jete, a man is selected to travel back in time using a process very similar to Richard's. In order to do this successfully, people with very strong mental images of the past are chosen. This man is selected for his strong mental image of a woman's face, and he successfully, albeit temporarily, travels through time. As a method of time travel, it seems that the mind is the best way to go. For now, it's the only way to go. We travel through time constantly, whenever we hear a song that we haven't heard in years, whenever we think about the future with excitement or anxiety, whenever we remember good times and bad, and whenever we watch a movie that we saw for the first time a long time ago.